Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Could I welcome you all to today's meeting of the Public Petitions uh, Committee? And as always, could I ask everyone to switch off any electronic devices because it interferes uh, with the sound system. Uh, no apologies have been received to date. And please note the meeting will be suspended at around 10.45 to allow those who wish to go to the Remembrance Day commemoration at the Garden Lobby at 11 a.m. The meeting will reconvene once the commemoration has concluded. And obviously members of the gallery are very uh, welcome uh, to attend this as well. Uh, agenda item two is consideration of new petitions. The first item of business is consideration of four new petitions. The committee agreed to invite the petitioners to speak to three of the petitions. The first new petition is PE 1530 uh, by Spencer Files on behalf of the Scottish Secular Society on guidance on how creationism is presented in schools. Members of a note by the clerk, the spice briefing, the petition and the submission. Uh, can I welcome the petitioner? Um, thank you very much for coming along. And Professor Paul uh, Braderman, who's the board member and scientific advisor for the Scottish Secular Society to the meeting. Um, if you could speak for around five minutes, um, I'll have some questions and then ask my colleagues to come along as well. Uh, good morning, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to come along and present our petition. This petition has attracted international attention because of the issues that are involved. Scotland's future depends on science, especially the life sciences, a topic which the convener himself has addressed here in the chamber. The signatories and those who have written messages of support, including teachers, ministers of religion and three Nobel Prize scientists, Evolution and the unity of life are central concepts to modern biology, just as the existence of atoms is central to the concept of modern chemistry. The alleged object objections to a common ancestry, such as those put forward by the Centre for Intelligent Design, just as much as the objections to an old earth put forward by so-called um, creationist scientists, lack all intellectual merit. If you disagree with what I just said, and you should, dis you should dismiss our petition and give your reasons for doing so. But if in your assessment of the science you agree with us, with the overwhelming scientific evidence, a sample of which we have sent to the committee, with the science outlined in the Curriculum for Excellence, and with the massive stated consensus along, among the world's scientific communities, then only the, the only remaining question for us to answer is how do we best protect our children from this campaign of disinformation? This is not about religion. This is about science. Despite some reports, the Scottish Secular Society is neutral on matters of faith. It has faith-diverse membership. As the Spice briefing paper shows, we have no wish to, res to restrict the, di the discussion of any religious or philosophical viewpoint. There is indeed a strong tradition across the faith spectrum welcoming evolution as a manifestation of divine creativity. In view of what we've seen recently from the Challenger bus from people with the Mission Ministries, the plain declaration of intent by the Centre for Intelligent Design and other evidence that we can present, it is no longer credible to ignore the fact that there are organisations attempting, and with some success, to penetrate our schools in order to present creationism, young earth doctrines, as a valid alternative to the established science. Why can we not, as the government suggests, simply just leave this to the good judgment of our teachers? Well, firstly, and let's hope not many, some teachers may well themselves be creationists. I personally have come across this through um, interactions with my child's nursery nurse. Second, there are places where even teachers, although may not be creationists, may experience pressure from that community to introduce creationism and, in fact, ignore the teaching of evolution. Third, teachers may feel unprepared to teach about evolution especially if they, are, they expect a creationist challenge from the local chaplain. This will be especially true at the primary level with re religious, moral and philosophical education, which is rarely itself taught by science graduates. Finally, most importantly, it is rarely the teachers themselves that are actually the problem, but volunteers vis volunteer visitors and externally funded chaplains whose offerings are often gratefully accepted by the schools who are currently coping with many other pressures. That is why we refer our petition and materials being presented rather than taught. And in the absence of the guidance we seek, any teacher who would want to object to any particular creation activities might well find themselves placed in an impossible position. You'll all be familiar, hopefully, with the scandal at Kirkton Home Primary School. And what was most alarming about that incident is that the chaplain responsible had been imposed and assisted by volunteers from his church for eight years undetected. The material distributed there beggars belief. This is why we have prepared copies for the committee to peruse. 
Such material is typical of so-called creation science, a mid-20th century development, as my doctor, colleague Braidsman, could possibly explain later on. The Perth-based Challenger bus pays a regular visit to many schools throughout Scotland. Visiting the bus incorporated, is incorporated into the school day, where children are strongly urged to take part, and parents, where they are given permission, are not normally told that the bus itself is provided by People with a Mission Ministries, an organisation that features materials from Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis, a notorious US-based uh, Young Earth Creationist organisation which has actually attacked this petition twice now. Um, other creationist organisations also distribute materials or actually offer speakers to schools. Numerous schools are known to have creationist chaplains and creationist denominations, including US-inspired extreme creationist sects. They are often represented on school chaplaincy boards. We can supply details for the councils from some local authority committees and some examples around South Lanarkshire, Clackmannanshire and Falkirk. Members from these churches with extreme creationist young earth views could potentially make things difficult teach for teachers in their employ. The organisation Truth and Science, young earth creationists, have sent copies to every school, copies of creationist pseudo-text misnamed Explore Evolution. This book is a production of the Seattle-based Discovery Institute, of which the Centre for Intelligent Design is closely associated. The Creation Research Institute, which promotes creation sciences amongst creationist groups offering speakers to schools also. One, has also, one school and such in the Highlands has used the Genesis story being taught as literal truth and has indeed um, designated one corner of the classroom in the past called the Creation Corner. At least three schools, to our knowledge, have hosted debates between creationists and defenders of mainstream science, although two such cases, the relevant councils later denied it in a freedom information request that such a thing had ever happened. In the words of one of the schools, last session, our higher RMPS class attended a Q&A with a creationist. This was then followed up with a similar event with an evolutionist as part of their course. But this was not part of their studies and was not this was part of the studies not advocating one particular set of beliefs. Now this is absurd having a QA session for, it's almost like having a QA session from a flat earther and for the sake of balance it, having a, a discussion with a sphericalist. Creationist presentation, but the fact that this is even staged implies that there is an intellectual parity that just does not exist. Given these facts, it is no longer credible to deny that the existence of a problem, that this is a problem in, in need of official attention. The first step in solving any problem is to recognise that Scotland actually has one. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your presentation. A um, couple of questions I have um, on the other bits of evidence that we had to our committee. Um, uh, one, one argument was that... Um, what you're suggesting would in fact may well breach the European Convention of Human Rights, which is the rights for parents to have children educated in line with their religious and philosophical views. What's your response to that? Um, no, I, I don't think it does breach any right, because if that right was implemented as such as they view it, you would be teaching that the earth is 6,000 to 10,000 years old to the majority of pupils, which um, would clearly contravene many uh, areas of the curriculum for excellence. Uh, the other criticism was that your petition um, didn't recognise the difference between creationism and intelligent design. How would you respond to that? Um, let the professor answer this question, if yeah, it's OK. Yeah, we, uh, I take a whistle as that you don't uh, agree with that, Professor. Yeah, it is a magnificent sight to see the director of the Centre of Intelligent Design asserting, turning purple in the face, that intelligent design and creationism have nothing to do with each other. And yet you will see, as I put in my response to his submission, his submission paragraph 1-7, it is of the essence of his case to cast doubt on the idea that natural processes such as primarily evolution could have given rise to the diversity of life by pretending that there is serious, devout, serious doubt about what he calls macroevolution and which most of us would call evolution full stop as part of the overall unity of life. In other words, while I'm sure he's sincere here, I believe he's a bit muddled, while he believes that intelligent design is not creationism, it incorporates as part of its rhetorical structure a questioning of what is in our submission and what I think you should also regard as the established science of common descent of living things. Creation, all, adv all advocates of intelligent design 
nearly all advocates of intelligent design deny what they call macroevolution. In this, they're going against the evidence. <coughs> and indeed, one of the web organs for the intelligent design community is called Uncommon Dissent, in order to emphasize the fact that common dissent, which is what we claim to be part of the absolutely established science, common dissent is, in their view, not established science. So by our definition, they are definitely creationist. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, as I'm sure you're aware this is a very, very large area, and I suspect we could debate this all day. Unfortunately, we've got uh, 20 minutes. I'm sure my colleagues will be focusing on the practicalities of education policy, because I think that's the, the crucial issue for us. Could I bring in Chick Brody? Yeah, just on that, I think. Good morning. Just on that, I, I mean, having heard your evidence, uh, Mr. Fildes, regarding um, <clears throat> the role of teachers uh, and, and the fact that you're not uh, dissembling in terms of what they should or they shouldn't teach. Why shouldn't, if they sh so choose, why shouldn't they be allowed to you know, present intelligent design or creationism to, to pupils? Um, it's not a case of whether they should or shouldn't be allowed to. It's the context and how it's presented. Um, for instance, my son was in the woods when he was asking the question about natural fauna and the teacher was unable to give a, a scientific or biological response, so therefore immediately referred to God makes all things and we're all made from Adam and Eve. And my son came home asking me more questions about this. Now, I'm personally an atheist, so I wasn't happy about it. So I went back to the school to complete. Forgive me, you, you, the petition says that you want to bar the presentation in Scot to bar the presentation in Scottish publicly funded schools of separate creation and of young earth doctrines. As valid, uh, as valid, as valid alternatives to science. science. That's important. If you think they are valid alternatives to the established science, you should say so and you should throw us out. But that validity surely is underpinned by the fact that you, the point you've made, that it should be down to teachers to determine the curriculum and how they present it. But if it's down to teachers, in my own personal experience, then that has not been implemented fairly. What evidence and, do you have of that? Well, the evidence I have of that comes from um, many areas. I've just given you my own personal experience, so you've had it from the top. Um, yeah, but what's wider experience? Well, because yeah, you, yeah. Your frame of reference quite clearly is of, course. is of a particular nature. Yeah, well, so what uh, wider evidence do you have yeah, yeah, well, that's the case? What, what we have um, through the Scottish Secular Society, we, we are basically a medium where, and we offer platforms where people from all walks of life and all faiths report into us and discuss with us in an, in an open debate platform and also privately through email. Um, many of the concerns that are raised to us, unfortunately, come through as a private matter. And they always wish to remain confidential, but nevertheless make the complaint. How, and they don't want to be named. However, their statements, they are quite happily um, they're quite happy for us to refer them to the committee. And one such statement um, of evidence of creationism and the discussion of creationism taking place comes through from one concerned Highland parent who wishes to remain anonymous. And if I can just read out one quick paragraph from her. A couple of years ago, I went to an open afternoon in the school's children's work on display. A banner in the corner of the classroom said, Creation Corner. Intrigued, I went over to investigate and in my naivety thought it was going to be an art display. No, it was exactly what it said. A big handmade wall chart with flipping pages detailing how the world had been created in seven days. In the beginning, there was light and dark. I was pretty horrified and seemed to remember asking one of the teachers where Evolution Corner was, only to be met by dirty looks from the teacher. But on the basis of um, the need for that debate, what debate have you had with the, with the, 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 the main uh, bodies of, of you know, the perpetrators of intelligent design and uh, creationism? Um, check or, we I mean, it seems to me that we're you know, throwing uh, bricks at each other without you before even coming here. Yeah, because we've had that discussion. We're no, because we're not seeking compromise with them. Oh, I see. No there can't questions. be compromise in the science class with creationism. No more questions. Okay. Uh, Jackson Carlow. Uh, good morning. Thank good morning. you. Uh, I'm something of an atheist too, albeit an unconvinced and unhappy one, but uh, nonetheless. Um, you said that your petition had attracted international interest and support, although I notice it's got no signatories uh, attached to it, which uh, I just have to, maybe you can explain. I'm also struck by the fact that Charles Darwin might rather recognise your predicament because, of course, at one point the role was completely reversed and it was the science that was being challenged rather than the alternative. Uh, now, I wasn't present at the creation of the planet, 
Uh, I'm skeptical about most things, although I tend towards the evolutionary scientific theory that you yourself espouse. But I really would like to know what you think the worst is that can happen. The worst is that can happen is there is a distortion of learning in the classroom. Now, Scotland at the moment is um, the life sciences and biomedical side of our industry is flourishing. We have some of the greatest stars coming through, some of the most creative minds. And from a young age, I, wouldn't, I would be horrified to think that there is any potential for those minds to be distorted in any way by suffering any form of cognitive dissonance when it comes to young earth doctrines, creationism, and what is actual science and what is real. Not a case of philosophizing over science, but teaching the facts. But do we, not, do we not live in a slightly more real environment? I mean, my mother, for example, was told in her biology class uh, went to her biology. Her mother told her that she was delivered by a stork. She obviously went to a biology class and heard that there was a more scientific uh, way in which she was delivered. Went home and her mother told her that maybe how they do things in Scotland, but it's certainly not how they do them in England. Yeah. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is parents have a role in education. Young people are impressionable, but education is a much more rounded thing. And I just wonder really by, in a sense, seeking to drive what you and I might, reg I think, both regard as, 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 a, a, as a ridiculous notion, underground, it really doesn't serve any particular purpose. I, I'm not persuaded that any real harm is being done in all of this, and I think in the wider context of education, in the wider context of the parental involvement, in the wider context of the school, do you not think that the evolutionary model will prevail? Um, yes, it will prevail in all matters, Jackson, and, and what you're kind of doing there is diluting the argument somewhat. Um, as far as um, the, your mother being told about stocks, I think that's pretty much still the case in Scotland, so we have an issue there with sex education, I believe. But um, I'll refer this moment... But, people, but my, point, <laughs> my point is, people through a form of education come to understand that the truth is somewhat different, but, well, why? without it necessarily having been emphasised in the way that you might have wished. Yeah, I'll pass this to Paul, but before I do that, well, why should we assert such untruths to our children in an educational establishment, particularly the science class? That isn't a whole world view. Oh, well, I mean, I've gone through life with children being taught about socialism, which is equally discredited, but it doesn't do really any great harm them being told what it's all about. So, I mean, I, I wonder just what you really think the physical damage to the intellect of a child in the round is going to be. And if you can point... Or is it just a concern you have that it, this might lead to something more sinister? But can you point to anything at the moment that has yes. actually been damaged in the kind of development of children into adults as a result of yes. having been exposed to this theory in the midst of all the real science? Yes, there are. There have been, there have been, there have been, case, there have been cases reported in the press of not in Scotland, I'm glad to say, of students actually walking out of lectures at university level because the lectures are based on evolution. There is concern in the scientific community about the effect of evolution rejection on subject choice at university level. My colleague, Roger Downey, an emeritus professor now in the Department of Biology at Glasgow University has carried out interesting research into the effects of creationist belief on subject choice among subject choice among students, and I think that he is certainly one of the people, if I may, may presume to say so, that this committee should communicate with. I know that you are a strong believer in individual choice, individual freedom, individual making up of your mind, and I absolutely agree with you on all this. Nonetheless, if you tell children untruths at a stage when they are going to believe you, that is going to affect their outlook on life indefinitely, especially when you remember that most of them will not actually be studying science at university level. One last, but we tell children that Santa Claus exists. Uh, we, uh, we tell children that Santa Claus exists, as it were, in inverted commas. No. We don't tell children that Santa Claus exists, <laughs> so we're doing and their commas eternal in my salvation <laughs> depends on believing that Santa Claus exists. <laughs> okay, fine. Thank could you. just ask if witnesses and members could go through the chair, otherwise yeah. so it becomes that's what they call a rammy in Glasgow <laughs> terms. Um, before I bring John Wilson in, just for the record, I understand that it's actually seven, nearly 700 people have signed the petition. Uh, John Wilson. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, 
you've mentioned, Mr. Fields, the issue about Clubmanager, Falkirk, and South Lanarkshire, and issues that have been identified there. Could you expand on what those issues are? Because I think this is goes to the heart of your petition, and I would like you to expand on the reasons why you think it is necessary to bring this petition forward to the, this committee and to the Parliament at this time. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously have to present our evidence base here to demonstrate and illustrate that this is actually going on. I think that, that's a primary concern. So we've made freedom of information requests asking specific authorities if they have indeed invited anyone to talk on creationism or debate on creationism. And an example of um, how I can possibly say how some educational authorities are actually un are unaware that this is taking place comes from East Renfrewshire. East Renfrewshire responded to our Freedom of Information request um, asking, within the last three years, have East Renfrewshire fu publicly funded schools addressed by speakers from Creation Ministries International or by any other speakers who claim macroevolution is speculative or the evidence supporting separate creation over evolution or a young earth over an ancient earth? And the answer was no. However, our friends in the Scottish Secular Society were um, made aware that this was not actually the case and reported this back to us. And I have a statement here that was forwarded to us through a conversation that took place through the, one of the reverends who had indeed been in a school saying, I went to Wellingwood High School yesterday at the request of an RE teaching friend to discuss creation with his higher class. I had a great time. They were very nice and all left claiming to take the creationist position more seriously. The basic message was, I believe in the Bible, you believe the scientists' theories. Neither of us can prove our positions. But I am hopeful of the view that life and God will do right in the end, and the Saviour who will give me everlasting life. Like I say, I had a great time. With that response, the, the issue that picked up in some of the evidence was concern that whether it's a pastor, preacher, minister, reverend, or whoever from a particular organisation, particularly the creationist intelligent design side of the argument, we're going into schools and presenting arguments in the schools uh, out with the RE lessons, uh, and we're actually bringing in volunteers to come and assist them in the schools. Uh, what evidence do you have of that? Because I think the, the issue is that while the, the guidance, current guidance at the present moment from the issued by the Scottish Government is that teachers are responsible for what is taught in the classroom, uh, if, as you said in your earlier comments, if someone comes along and says to a teacher, I've got three people that are prepared to come in and work with your class on a particular issue, uh, what's wrong with that? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, as long as it, they operate within the confines of the, the rules and within the curriculum for ec excellence. However, unfortunately, it, we, it is the case that some do come in with alternative agendas, um, as in the case of Kirkton Home Primary School last year. And, you know, we have one instance here, that's just one instance in East Renfrewshire that's gone unnoticed, but it went unnoticed in, in East Kilbride for eight years. And, you know, there is no, no real mechanism in place or no reporting structure, audit trail, or I don't know, forgive me, because I don't know how the school inspectors deal with this, but there isn't an actual um, reference point or guide, as we're seeking, that anyone can refer to to, to record such matters or inc incidents. And that's what we're asking you to do. To, sorry, Convener, just to, to expand this slightly, because in the Scottish education system at the present moment, we have three types of education. We have the private sector, we have denominational it's education. Public schools. And well, public schools, or private, in Scotland, we talk about private education. Uh, the, and we have non-denominational schools. In the terms of the, we know in terms of denominational schools what the religious affiliation is. Uh, we, in non-denominational schools, we have a number of teaching staff who have a particular faith belief. Is it wrong that those teachers impose that faith belief in non-denominational schools on the pupils that attend those schools? Yes. No further questions. Mm -hmm. Anne McTaggart. Thanks, Mr. Um, it's to ask, and good morning, panel. Morning. You've now mentioned, Mr. Fields, the, that it's... They pretended, Files, pretended he's not there. Okay. Files, Mr. Files, um, you've mentioned on several occasions now that it's went unnoticed in 
an area, I'm sure it was Hamilton, for eight years. How do you think you could rectify that? Um, by this committee, um, going back to the Education and Culture Committee and actually seeking evidence, um, asking for, um, for different groups to come in and, and ask for their references on this and their considerations and opinions on this as whether or not it's needed, because we believe it is needed. Um, if, I mean, I can just show you one other thing that, that comes through. This is a, a six-day mural from a school in Kokori. Okay, and this is something that's been evident that this was placed on the school corridor for all of the school to see. Now, someone's commissioned this. Someone's asked for this to be produced. Um, I referred this matter to, I called, sorry, I sent an email to the authorities in Fife to ask about this. They referred it directly to the school. The school phoned me um, and the head denied that this was on the wall. But I have photographic evidence sent by an anonymous parent that it is actually indeed has been on the wall, but has since been taken down. So these kind of things go on. And as soon as they're challenged, they tend to contend that they don't go on. Now, we don't want that conflict. And this is what we're trying to avoid by asking for clear and explicit guidance. Just for, for the record, if you're referring to an item that we haven't seen, could you leave it with the clerk? I've, I've got copies for yeah. you. Could so you leave it with the clerk so we I could reference it for I the official record? Them in the inserts, yeah. so I thought I'd just um, thanks, convener. So, if this had, so if it was then recorded, would that satisfy you? It's not a case, really, Anne, of satisfying us. Um, it's satisfying teachers and parents, um, and that's they're the ones that are primarily at the root of this. It's to make sure that they can, their children, they have the knowledge that their children are going to go through primary and secondary school with a scientific knowledge and exposure to science unhindered. That's all it is. We're not asking for a massive change in legislation. We're not asking for much here. We're just asking for some guidance to be issued to, to rid any ambiguity around this. Also, you had mentioned earlier, Mr Fields, that you hadn't been in contact with any other agency with regards to this petition. Could I ask you to explain a wee bit more as to why? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, we're a secular society. So, like I say, we're of many faiths and none. So we have this discussion with members within the secular society um, on our Facebook um, open group, which is one of the most hotly debated areas I think, on Facebook sometimes. And we consult with our administration board. We hold uh, monthly meetings, administrative meetings. And, we, and on our board, we have pagans, we have Muslims, we have Christians, ex-Muslims, etc. But the most important people that we speak with are the parents who, come, who directly contact us regarding this matter. And it's through their consultation and it's through their complaint that we're here today because they're the ones that are writing to us with the complaint, with the distressed emails, telling us that they want something done. But the problem with the system is they want to remain anonymous because they don't want their names put out in the open for fear of reprisals from the school. So we have a system that says, well, you can't do that because this piece of guidance says you can't. That makes it so much easier for all bodies. Okay. Sorry, but we're very, very short of time. I've got time for a very quick uh, final question from Chick Brody, and then we'll go to summation. Leaving this subject aside, if we may for a minute, have you any idea where we should bar Scottish publicly funded schools you're talking about alternatives? Yes. Well, you just Have you any idea whether it's in, in other areas of science or in English or what have you? Well, we, when you're in art, you don't teach maths. And when you're in biology, you don't teach chemistry. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Well, I, I don't think we, we should bar anything else. I think we should just make a clear distinction mm -hmm. that creationism is incompatible with science. That's merely it. If there were people who wanted to go into the schools to deny the reality of atoms, we would be here talking about that as well. But it's not the case regarding atoms, but it is regarding the fact of evolution. Okay. Which is healthy if there's a, a compromise and ongoing discussion, is it not? Well, the compromise well, check is that... Parents and children and people of faith have their church, they have their home, they have religious and moral education and philosophy. They have many avenues in which they can discuss this. It just it shouldn't be discussed in the science class. That's if all. you're talking about compromise, I think you were within the, within the biological community. Of course, there's ongoing discussion about the mechanics of evolution, just as there's ongoing discussion about the ultimate causes of gravity. But there is no dispute that if you drop something, it falls, and there is no dispute within the scientific community. As, apart from synthesized disputes, there's no real dispute as to, as to the fact that you and a monkey are second cousins, you and a monkey are fourth cousins, you and a mushroom are fourth cousins. That is how it is, and the record shows it. 
Thank you. And to deny that, I'm it's not sure if that's unparliamentary language, but um, I quickly move on. Um, um, thank you very much for the debate. As I said at the start, I suspect we could debate this for several hours. Um, however, the committee is now moving summation, so there's no further questions from the witnesses or from um, the committee members. Um, obviously, um, we need to look at the next steps. Committee members were aware that we could um, obviously write to the Scottish Government, who are in, obviously in charge of education policy, um, or a variety of other groups. The other um, option uh, is that we could obviously refer this to the Education Committee, which has obviously the resident debt of this particular issue, or a variety of other options that members may well come up with. Could you get um, a steer? Yeah. Yeah. Comment. There's no such thing as doing nothing at this stage, because to do nothing is to send a signal yeah. that you're happy with how things are. Among people you should write to, I respectfully suggest, the Association for Science Education, which is the Sorry, largest... Sorry, I should have said at the start that we've, we've stopped contributions from witnesses now. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. I'm um, yeah, what, to, just to summarise, what we're looking at then is we could write to the Scottish Government, which is obviously in charge of education policy, we could refer this to the Education um, uh, Committee, or a variety of other options that I'm sure members may well come up with. Or, of course, we could close the petition, which is always an option uh, at any occasion we have a petition. Uh, Chip Brody? Yeah, I, I, I subscribe to the last view. Uh, we've already had, as recently as August, August uh, a statement from the, the government in terms of uh, leaving the uh, tradition uh, that uh, we should not determine the curriculum and that it's a matter for the educationalists uh, and I don't know uh, to write to them and then get back the same answer doesn't seem to me uh, particularly constructive. John Wilson? Give me a right. My view is that I think we should write to the Scottish Government to seek clarification on the situation, particularly in light of the examples that have been given by the petitioners today, because I think there is an issue that we need to get clear uh, from the Scottish Government, because clearly we are not in a situation where we read the headlines in Birmingham, <coughs> uh, where there was allegations made against a particular religious grouping who were trying to influence teaching within the school uh, curriculum in Birmingham. And I think it would be useful to get an up-to-date view uh, from the Scottish Government in light of that. But Convener would also suggest the committee write to the Educational Institute for Scotland, because the petitioners have made reference to the Educational Institute for Scotland in terms of their views. Also, the Secondary School Teachers Association in Scotland, as well as the Head Teachers Association of Scotland. Because I think there needs to be, in my view, a clear steer given <coughs> to teaching staff about what is permissible to be taught within the lessons. And I know my colleagues said, uh, not too particularly happy with that, but I think there needs to be a steer that we do not find ourselves in a situation where because an individual, a group or individuals have resources to go into an, an educational pr facility and teach something that may conflict with the current views and current science, that we need to be very careful how that is taught in the classroom. And I do, like one of the witnesses today, I do have experience where uh, my daughter's primary school, where we had a, a head teacher who came from a particular faith background, who was imposing that faith background, particularly on religious education classes, uh, and was not w widening out the curriculum to actually bring in other faiths or other beliefs in the teaching in those classrooms. So uh, we need to get clear, uh, a clear steer from the Scottish Government about how this is done. But the other organisations, I think, are important to contact because they need guidance as well, Convener. Thank you for that. Uh, David Torrance, what's your views? Um, convener, I'm happy to go along with John Wilson's uh, recommendations. Thank you. Up target. Thanks, Convener. I'm not happy to go along with John Wilson's um, suggestion. The Scottish Government spokesman just the 31st of August clearly stated that teachers, head teachers and professional educationalists decide what is taught in Scotland's schools. Like what Chick Brodie had said, it's not for politicians to de determine the curriculum. It's highly va valued and remains a cornerstone of the Scottish education. That, that's effectively going for closure then, just to check for the record. I'm at target. Right, thank you. Um, Angus McDonald. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I think there, there is an argument, actually, to refer to the Education Committee. Um, however, um, at this early stage, I feel it's, it's only fair uh, that we should get an up-to-date response from the Scottish Government, despite the fact that they have uh, given, a, a spokes, uh, given a statement to the Sunday Herald 
uh, as recently as the 31st of August, in which they say uh, this long-standing tradition that politicians should not determine the curriculum is highly valued and remains a cornerstone of Scottish education. But um, I think it would be unfair to close the petition at this stage. Um, we should um, give them the, the, the benefit of the doubt and get an up-to-date response from Mr. the Scottish government. Captain. Right, yeah. thank you. That's three. Um, Jackson, Carla? It's to that statement that um, Angus MacDonald has referred that, slightly terrified by uh, John Wilson's suggestion that we become very prescriptive about what uh, is taught in schools. I'm not myself in favour of closing the petition at this stage, but in light of what the government has already said, I would be in favour of writing to them to ask them to confirm their view that they believe that the systems and uh, the, uh, the discretion which exists just now is robust enough to ensure that in the round uh, children uh, come out with the broadest possible education based on rational common sense without there being a need to interfere in the content of that. Um, I did hear from the witnesses when I asked what actual harm had been done, some anecdotal examples of things that might have occurred at international universities, which I thought really seemed very distant and far removed from the experience of primary schools in Scotland today. So it, it would be more that the government was uh, committed to the view that the robust enough systems existed for them to cope with any uh, curious views that might emerge, uh, and perhaps for them to say that at some stage in the future, if they ever felt that was under threat, they would review this particular issue in the light of that, those changed circumstances. Thank you. All members have now spoken, and, and, and clearly there is a majority to, that we write to the Scottish Government. Could I just confirm that uh, members are also happy to write to the various educational institutions that um, John uh, Wilson referred to? Is that, is that agreeable? Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay, so as a majority to write to the Scottish Government, could I then confirm the other points that John Wilson made with EIS and the Scottish Secondary Teacher Association, the Head Teacher Association, uh, can ask then to show those who are in favour of writing to these organisations as well. That's, that's a majority. Um, do I have, members have any other uh, issues they want to raise before we move on? Right. Well, thank you. As you've heard, we've uh, written to, we will now take action uh, to write to all these organisations. We'll obviously have this on a future agenda where we'll discuss your petition again. And obviously the, the clerks will keep you up to date. Um, you're obviously welcome to be in the gallery that day if you just check with the clerks when it's coming up. And so thank you both for coming along and giving evidence to us. And I suspend for two minutes to allow our witnesses to swap round. Thank you. Uh, the second new petition today is PE 1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland against the care tax on the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. Members have a note by the clerk, the spice briefing and petition. Uh, can I welcome the petitioner, uh, Jeff Adamson, uh, Ian Hood and Dr Pauline Nolan. Um, and I will invite uh, Mr. Addison to speak for uh, around five minutes and set uh, the ball rolling with some questions. As I intimated at the start, we will have to conclude at quarter to 11 
for the Remembrance Parade. Um, however, I will make sure that you get your allocated half hour of time, and if you don't get that time now, then if you come back after the Remembrance Parade, uh, I'll make sure that you get your full quota, because it's an important uh, issue. Could I ask Mr Adson to speak then? Uh, could you make it a maximum of five minutes, Mr Adson? Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to focus on three areas of community care charging, how it affects me, the inconsistency of charging, and the detrimental effect charging has on carers of disabled people. In 1999, an undetected tumour next to my spine hemorrhaged, leaving me paralysed and needing 24 hours care each day. After my discharge from hospital, I tried to continue working, but it proved to be impossible and I had to retire. I was comforted by the knowledge that, having paid into a pension scheme, I would have an income which, along with disability-related benefits, would allow me to lead a decent life rather than merely exist. The reality proved to be quite different. In 2000, I agreed a support package with my local authority, Midlothian. I employed personal assistants to assist me with various tasks which will allow me to continue to lead a normal life. However, there's a price that disabled people who need support have to pay, a price that severely restricts their choices, control, freedom and dignity, care charges. These are means tested. In my case, I am allowed a personal allowance of £137 a week. Any income I have above that amount is taxed by Midlothian Council at the rate of 70%, in my case £661 a month. No account is taken of any disability-related expenditure. For example, the average family fuel bill is approximately £1,200. As I need a warmer temperature than most, my bill is near £2,000. No account is taken of the cost of maintaining my house, whose mortgage I paid off when I stopped working. If I was still paying my mortgage, the interest payment would be added to my personal allowance. If I was renting a property, that cost would be added to my allowance, and any repairs would be paid for by the landlord. Many people would think that I was foolish to pay off my mortgage and should have invested the money. However, disabled people who receive community care support are discouraged to save. In Midlothian, as soon as any savings reach £6,000, every extra £250 is judged to be earning £52 a year. Any savings over £16,500 would mean paying the full cost of my support package. So far, I've only mentioned Midlothian Council's charging policy. But since 2002, COSL has been trying to achieve consistency and charging policies throughout Scotland. How consistent are these policies now? If we look at the, the areas that you represent and take my 80 hours support a week and monthly charge of £661 as an example, in East Renfrewshire I would pay £93 less per month, in Glasgow £188 less, East Lothian £235 less. Highland, £263 less. North Lanarkshire, £378 less. And in Falkirk, a staggering £558 less per month. I should add that Midlothian is not at the top of the charging league. If I lived in Moray, I would be paying £948 a month, £287 more than I currently do. So 12 years on and we're still nowhere near achieving consistency on charging policies. Care charging also affects my wife. She cares for me for over 43 hours each week. When I first came out of hospital, my wife was working full time. Adding these hours and the hours providing my daycare meant that she was working at least 80 hours a week with no days off. This way of life eventually took its toll on her physically, but more importantly, it affected her mental health. Diagnosed with depression, she had no choice but to reduce her working week by half. This has meant a positive change to her health and well-being. 
However, the downside is the effect on her earnings. She is being financially penalised for providing me with care in two ways. By losing half her pay and by having to subsidise me because of my reduction in income due to care charges. Like me, she has had her choices, control, freedom and dignity eroded. Community care is needed to eliminate discrimination, promote equality of opportunity and protect human rights. Without it, many disabled people cannot participate in society on an equal basis with others. We believe charging breaches at least seven different rights. Is this a fair and just society? Is this the way in which a fair and just society should treat disabled people and their carers by taxing them to live a normal life? I think not and would challenge anyone to disagree. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you much for your contribution and uh, apologies, I should have mentioned that Jackie Bailey is a strong supporter of this petition. Um, do you wish to speak to the petition? I'm happy to let the committee go. Okay, right, Th thank you very much. I've just a couple of questions and I'll bring my, my colleagues in. Um, in your submission you mention um, that care charges have risen by 12% by local authorities over the last three years. And you mentioned, I think it was Aberdeen City, you didn't make quite clear, but I think it was Aberdeen City you said had doubled in the last two years. Is there then a line for having a much stronger consistency across Scotland? Otherwise you get to the sort of cliched postcode lottery. If you begin to live in one area, you mentioned Murray is much higher and you live in another. Can I pass that on to uh, Ian Hood? Yes. Uh, we would like to say that those figures that we put in the uh, report actually turn out to be for the three years up to last year. If we add in these figures, the actual increase over the last four years is now 21% uh, in care charges. And there is indeed, um, unfortunately, very much a postcode lottery. Uh, the, the rate of increase has is, is been very, very high in some areas, and in other areas, for example, like Dundee, only really increased in line with inflation. And this continues to extend across Scotland and creates a really mixed pattern of care charges. I suppose there's a sort of philosophical problem between having a very centralised approach to, to local government, whereby uh, the Scottish Government lays down uh, a diktat, for, if you like, from Edinburgh and every local authority follows, versus giving local authorities a bit more autonomy to carry out their own decision making. And these things are very difficult to, to work out. What's your, what's your view on that dilemma? We, we think that there is a, there's a real problem here, right? and, and there is a dilemma that, that needs to be managed. In 2002, the Scottish Government gave uh, local authorities quite clear instructions to, have, to sort out the problem of inconsistency and care charging, and they gave them three particular areas to sort out. They wanted to look at disability-related expenditure, the different tax rate, the taper rate that's mentioned, you know, and the amount of money that people got to keep. In the 12 years since then, COSLA has not been able to move at all closer to actually achieving any consistency in this matter in 12 years. And that's because every time somebody suggests a reform, and myself and some colleagues work with COSLA on this, any reform that is suggested will benefit some councils and lose and cost others. And no council is, every, every council is willing to accept a reform that doesn't cost them anything and, and, and cost somebody else something. And there's a real problem here because COSLA doesn't have the authority and the, the, uh, to actually tell everybody what to do. They have to negotiate, and there are many different things that they have to negotiate. And that, I think, is, is the key reason why COSLA has not managed to deliver that consistency. And it may indeed be a really good thing to allow local authorities to make their own decisions. But in this case, the question really has to be is why are neighbouring local authorities differing so much? North Lanarkshire and East Ayrshire are neighbouring local authorities but if you live in one and you're under 65, you get £50 extra a week to live on than the other one. It's not because there's a difference in the way that people live. Thank you for that. Jackson Carlo. Uh, good morning. Uh, can I thank you for this petition, which I think is really uh, very important and quite excellently presented and has at its heart, I think, a very clear issue of concern. Um, I, I note what you say about the variable charges, and perhaps if I can run some questions together... Um, I'm interested to understand why you feel the Scottish Government, having um, uh, asked COSLA to harmonise this system so long ago, 
uh, what action they, to your knowledge, have taken in the light of nothing further having been done. I'm interested to know if you believe that this is a direct consequence now of a permanent council tax freeze, uh, that whilst that was a sustainable measure for a period of time, that councils are now left with no option but to seek to raise charges from uh, groups, whatever the variable nature of them, which is then compounding the effect on families, and that really this is one area where we can see that not everything is a, bu uh, is a bunch of roses as a result of council tax freeze. Um, and secondly, and, and finally, um, I imagine that the level at which charging now cuts in at one time bore some relation to the threshold for income tax, which of course is now significantly increased. It's way beyond six or even eight thousand. It's now ten thousand and set to rise further. Um, and in those circumstances, whether it really is not a clear injustice on people in these circumstances that uh, with a level of income tax threshold much higher, charges are being levelled on people with an income substantially less than we would deem it appropriate to level income tax. Yeah, uh, we are a little bit disappointed in what the Scottish government, actually the Scottish government has taken. We think that they are aware of this problem and we met recently with the Minister for Health, Alex Neil, and he is going to be referring the issue to a working group on non-residual care. But really over the last 12 years, there's been a lot of priorities for the Scottish Government and this one hasn't really focused. And one of the things that a lot of supported MSPs have asked questions about this and the, ref the reference that we get back is the COSLA working group is looking at the matter. And what we get is, and you'll have seen this in the briefing that you got today, uh, for today's committee, they talked about, for example, they're doing a new initiative in financial assessment forms and how this will deliver a whole big change. Well, I have here a financial assessment form from East Ayrshire. It is a sheet of A4, which simply totes up the money that people have to pay. Now, the idea that if you simply have a standard sheet for toting up the money, it's going to make a lot of difference to people, I think, is, is really causeless and... and managing that situation, I think, quite difficultly. The point about the council tax freeze, I think, is an important one, and I'm sure it's had an effect. We're not really in a position to assess that. Uh, but undoubtedly, one of the things that's happened over the last year is, uh, the last four years, is that the council tax freeze has been there. Councils have been forced to do what they would call income maximisation, and they have now got departments and officials whose job it is to simply go around the council and say, how can we get some more money in? How can we bring in some extra money in to help us? And these officials are the ones who see care charges as really being an income source, not about individuals that need care and support. And I think those two things are the things that merge together to help create that. So I'm afraid, I would be afraid that even if the council tax freeze ended, we wouldn't see the end of the story because income maximisation remains a real important drive for local authorities. They have to find ways of increasing their income. And finally, I, I couldn't agree more with, 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 with Jackson's point about the income tax threshold. I do think that the uh, coalition government has, has made a very important change uh, for people in raising the income tax threshold to £10,000. Uh, it means that everybody should know and understand that they have at least £200 or thereabouts per week without having to pay off that. But if you have a disability, if you're under 65, you've had £122. There's surely something wrong when we say that the most disabled people in our society have a worse deal you know, than even the poorest paid. Thank you very much. Are you complete? Um, so, yes, thank you. That, uh, answers. Yeah. John Wilson. Just for clarification, I'd like to ask the petitioners. Uh, the petition actually says to abolish, the uh, calls on the Scottish Government to abolish all local authority charges for non-residential care services. Are you, because um, what we've heard is the disparity in the charging regimes that currently exist in local authorities. And just for clarification, are you seeking total abolition, or are you seeking some uniformity in the charging regimes that are actually applied by local authorities? Because it would be useful for us to know if there is a, the bottom line is you want the Scottish Government to abolish all care charges, because the, one of the issues that will come from the Scottish Government, and you've made, Mr Hood's made reference to it in terms of uh, the financial situation of local authorities, is if the Scottish Government were to support this petition, 
then the argument from the local authorities would be somebody has to pay for these services, and if, if the Scottish Government abolished them, it would be the, the Scottish Government that would have to fund it. Uh, or is there a compromise position there whereby you'd say there should be charging regimes in place, but these charging regimes should be fair and consistent throughout Scotland? Problems would be that if the Scottish Government tried to reform the system, that because local authorities could continue to, in a sense, game the system to maximise their income, the Scottish Government would take on the responsibility for care charges, but also take on the blame for when they continue to go up because they hadn't resolved the problem. And we, we can't see if local authorities can't satisfactorily reform the system. How could the Scottish Government reform the system adequately? to deliver fairness across, across, across the fold. And uh, that's why we believe that abolition is, is really the only way to go forward. I, I wanted just to, to, to pass to my colleague, Dr Nolan, uh, who has got some issues to say about the human rights aspect of it, because the, the, it's, we, we think that, that there's a serious breach here, and I think that helps to understand why we think it should be ab abolished. So, um, all the rights protected by the Equality Act, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act and in subsequent human rights conventions signed up to by the government belong to disabled people. Article 19 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People or the UNCRPD states that disabled people have a right to live in the community with the support they need and can make choices like other people. And we think that charges for care breaches the following instruments, the United Nations, um, the UNCRPD, the Equality Act, the Human Rights Act, and it's in co direct contravention of the EU Directive on Freedom of Movement. And um, I could go on and list the rights. Would that be okay to do now? Yeah, so, or if, or um, if it's very lengthy, perhaps you'd like to give us a note of these. Yeah. I could give you a note of right. them, yeah. thank you. Thank but you. you can also ask me questions about any of okay. those. Thank you for that. I do, um, any other members wish to come in? Chick Brody. Just very briefly, because <clears throat> I know we've only got uh, two minutes now. Um, in, the, in the briefings that we had, there was reference to news articles that highlighted that some councils may be charging terminally ill people and, and, um, uh, under 65. In terms of discussion with COSLA, are you happy, leaving the charging aside for a minute, are you happy that the definitions of, of in, in the categories of, of disablement are at, in, in broadly are broadly consistent, or do they vary greatly? I mean, there are, there is real challenges. I mean, and the, the issue about how people were treated who were terminally ill, I think, highlights part of the part of the problem. I know that there was a. A, a quite a serious debate between the Minister for Health and the local authority concerned to try and resolve that particular problem. And th th it does come down to the way that local authorities treat this whole issue about care charges. And it is very much managed as a financial issue as opposed to one about... Well, the oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. the, 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 the first part of, the, of, of if, you, if you like, of the, mm -hmm. uh, this equation that we're trying to resolve is, uh, in terms of consistency and getting COSLA to achieve, is the interpretation of disablement, uh, if it's consistent. I mean, we now know that action is going to be taken on terminally ill, but in terms of uh, the degree of uh, uh, disability and, and what have you, it, has there been any rationalisation of that? We, I, I don't think that's a, that's a particular problem. I think, that, I think that councils have a quite clear understanding of who they apply these charges too, and I, I don't think that's so much so much of an issue. I think what's more difficult for many people is whether or not you get a care service in the first place. And I think that one of the, one of our concerns and is would be that if care charging was abolished, councils may worry that more people would come and get services and might push Please, more people out the door. Time right? the and that would that would be a real problem. All yeah. Users will be invited to observe two minutes silence of remembrance for all those who have suffered and died in the service of the country and all those who mourn them. There will be a further announcement to indicate the start and end of the period of silence. Yeah.
Um, as, you, as you've heard, we have to suspend uh, now, and uh, as I promised earlier, um, I would invite our witnesses and Jackie Bailey uh, to come back after the service that we're going to have. It will be approximately 11, 10 past 11, and could also invite members of the gallery who wish to attend, please uh, liaise with the security staff who will direct you to the garden lobby. So I now suspend till approximately 10 past or whenever the service is concluded. Thank you.
Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can I continue our meeting? The second new petition is PE 1533, which we started to discuss uh, before the Remembrance Service. And I think, uh, Chick Brodie, uh, the floor was yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just following on the question I asked was, was, was there any consistency across exercise through uh, COSLA to uh, ensure that there is parity or at least there uh, can be a consistent view? Has that, any of that discussion been, has, in your knowledge, uh, taking place with the Scottish Government in terms of them liaising with COSLA to ensure there's a consistency of approach? Yes, the Scottish Government has representatives that sit on the COSLA working group and, and there is a, a flow of information backwards and forwards. Uh, but unfortunately, we still have this whole pattern. Jeff gave examples of his own, about his own care varies. And we have a whole series of, of variations. For example, the taper rate that applies will vary from 100% in half a dozen local authorities down to just 15% in, in the Orkney Islands. So there's a huge variation in what people are expected to pay just depending on, on, on where you stay. And the intervention of the Scottish Government on this working group hasn't really helped. And, and in terms of the working group, uh, Ian, I mean, where are they at in terms of deliberations and fruition of, of you, know, you know, looking at things like this? If we, we, I, I, I and a number of other people sat in this working group from its formation, you know, uh, and, and, and they've been there all that time. And in effect, a number of us walked out earlier this year simply because we'd spent time, it wasn't delivering the change, and really we felt there was needed to be a different approach that the working group couldn't deliver, which is why we've taken part with 29 other voluntary organisations across Scotland and launched this petition, and it's why we have over 2,500 signatures uh, for the petition uh, here in support. We think there needs to be a different way of resolving this problem. Are you tell me it's a working group, but they've got no outcomes, no times. So why, unless they're there to serve a purpose, which is to produce meaningful outcomes, why are they there? I, I, I've been asking about uh, occupational pensions, which some local authorities regard as earned income. Uh, and that attracts a £20 disregard, so I'm allowed £20 extra on my personal allowance. Uh, some local authorities don't regard it as income. Uh, my own local authority doesn't regard it as income. However, the DWP and HMRC consider uh, an occupational uh, pension as being uh, income. I've asked about this for the last two or three years, and all I get is Cosler looking into it. That's all. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question to uh, Dr. Uh, Nolan? You, you talked about some uh, uh, legalities earlier on, and you were going to give us a note of these. Um, the question I had at the time was, what, under any of these uh, bits of legislation, has there been any legal challenge in the courts? Um, currently, there's no legal challenges, but we are likely to look into a legal challenge in terms of people being able to reclaim the money that they've spent on care charges. Of course, this is... Um, you know, there's there's lots of rights being affected as well as well the the right to live independently being included in the community, and um, personal mobility, and employment and adequate standard of living at a time where people probably don't know what is the root cause of their poverty because they're being hit by so many different cuts by so many different welfare reforms. And um, disabled people, as we know, are disproportionately affected by these cuts. And to have these charges coming along at the same time um, and just pushing people into poverty. And so that's the big concern, the biggest concern maybe. Um, Right. Yeah, well, there, there, for, there would yeah. hopefully be a test case. Yeah, what would the the time scale for the test case be? And, um, we 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 we've been doing some pre pre work with a lawyer called Tony Kelly, who was involved in a human rights case, uh, that went about uh, prisoners and swapping out to the European. And the previous experience, this is not a quick solution. It's not a quick solution, right? And therefore, for us, it's a last effort, a last resort. We would much rather resolve this amicably. Uh, and have, have it sorted out now, rather than come back and say, actually, it's not the uh, councils that you have to compensate for the ending of care charges. It's people that paid them illegally, you know, who need to be compensated. Now, we would rather this was sorted out now, properly, mm. before it got worse. Mm. We're told 
This year, Edinburgh Council is proposing to take another million pounds off disabled people, West Lothian £750,000 as part of the budget plans, and we expect other councils to follow suit. The longer that it takes to act, the more it will cost to resolve this. And certainly dealing with other petitioners, it's also a very expensive route. I understand you may be getting some pro bono work, but nevertheless, it's yeah. an expensive, tortuous route. But uh, yeah. it's useful to have that on, on yeah. the record. Uh, could I bring in Jackie Bailey? And, uh, you've been very patient. Um, thank you for coming along to the, co the committee. Perhaps I know you've been very supportive of the petition. Thank you. Patience, of course, is one of my well-known traits, convener. Um, it, it, it strikes me... Jackson Carlo raised his eyebrows. I'm disappointed. Um, <laughs> it strikes me that, that we spend a lot of the time in the Parliament talking about prevention and taking action before people um, end up in a crisis situation. And we all agree that sustaining people in their homes is absolutely the best option, yet we're doing exactly the opposite. And I know of constituents um, who are cancelling vital services because they feel they can't afford it. So, you know, people cancelling personal alarm systems or whatever, um, and I think that that is a, a backward step. Um, to answer Chick Brodie's question, because I'm conscious that the COSLA Scottish Government Working Group is probably a circular process um, that, that is designed um, to be referred to when, you know, difficult MSPs or indeed others in the voluntary sector raise this question of consistency of charging or of charging at all. And I certainly believe in and a much more simplistic form, if you don't charge, then there aren't issues of consistency to worry about. Because I know when I compare my own two local authorities, um, an FOI done by the Learning Disability Alliance Scotland some years ago, that one service for a learning disabled person was £30 a week in Western Bartonshire, but was 10 times that amount, £300 a week in neighbouring Argyll and Butte. And if we're honest about it, Scotland is far too small to have those wide differential in, in, in charging. But it's not just charging, it's differences in the criteria on which people are assessed. Um, you know, and again, that happens in neighbouring local authorities. And um, sad to say, I've now experienced care tourism, where people with a condition make very clear choices about where they live, depending on how good a local authority may be in meeting their needs. And again, that shouldn't be happening um, at this point in, in my view. Um, so we've seen the bureaucratic responses with the financial assessment papers and all of that, but actually no change to people's experience on the ground. I think there's a real opportunity here for the government and for the parliament. We are a, on the verge of health and social care integration where we're bringing two systems together, one where if you are dealt with by the health service, you turn up, they treat you, you're free, your treatment is free at the point of need, um, and there is no assessment of um, you know, any charging whatsoever. We're now going to integrate that with a system that actually assesses somebody's needs, decides what the priorities are, and then applies a charge. So we have an opportunity I think at this point in time, to create a change. I hope the committee agree um, that £50 million, pounds, whilst you know, to the ordinary man and woman in the street is a lot of money, to us it's a lot of money, actually in government terms, is very, very small in the context of their overall budget. I hope that they'll refer the petition to the Scottish Government with a degree of urgency, but there are other people um, you know, who I hope the committee might consider consulting. So, for example, um, is there any way we could seek any opinion on whether there are breaches of um, human rights from whether it's government lawyers or indeed from the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission? Um, there are people in the field, Child Poverty Action Group, um, Poverty Alliance, who actually can talk about care charging and its impact on disabled people living in poverty. Um, there's research here from the group itself about the cost of abolishing care charges. I don't know whether that's something SPICE might be invited to do a detailed paper on for the committee. Um, but all of those things, I think, convener, would be very helpful to advancing the petition. Right. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very conscious of time, but do any members have any urgent points who haven't spoken who wish to be in at this, this stage? Is there any final contributions from our... Sorry, I'll bring in John Wilson, then I'll bring in witnesses. John Wilson? Come here, sorry about that. You'd asked anybody who hadn't made a contribution. I know I hadn't made a contribution. It's just a question to Mr Hood. Mr Hood, you talk about the working group, the COSLA working group. Can I ask who convenes that group 
and who chairs that group? Because you said that the Scottish Government, you actually I took a note of the comment that you made. Uh, you actually said the intervention of the Scottish Government has not been helpful in this situation. But could I just get clarification on who, is actually, who coordinates the working group in COSLA? I'm, I'm afraid I may have misspoke if it wasn't helpful. I said it hadn't led to any significant change. Uh, that may be the same thing, but it wasn't. It was obstructive. Uh, I wasn't trying to put a position blame on Scottish Government. The COSLA Working Group is convened by the COSLA Policy Officers, uh, some of whom have been known to yourselves in the past, Ron Cully and, and, and Gary Smythe. Uh, it doesn't meet frequently, uh, and uh, on it are usually the, a, a rep a, can be a representative from each local authority a, from some from the voluntary sector. Currently, there is only two voluntary sector representatives, one from Age Scotland and one from Alzheimer's Scotland. The rest have left, along with m myself, and there is a couple of, of uh, officials from the Scottish Government Older People's uh, Section that, that goes along uh, to take part. And it's, it's a process of debate and discussion. Uh, and so the, the problem is that it hasn't actually started to meet for the next year's policy guidance but as I'm sure you've been reading the papers this year, East Renfrewshire, Inverclyde, Edinburgh, with, have all started to set their budgets, made their plans for it. So any extra spending that this committee comes up with will not, at the earliest, be available before 16, 17, you know? Uh, and, and possibly longer than that, as we've seen from, the, from its difficulty in doing that. So. Th thank you very much. Um, do you have any further contributions from witnesses, first of all? We would have just like to say one other thing, that we think that there's a, there's a serious issue with people who turn down services or reduce the amount of services that they take because of care charges. There's evidence from, for example, some councils like Fife have reported that this happens. The Audit Commission have, have recognised that this takes place. We have done a paper which looked at it. And in the, in the debate of health and social care integration, when simple things like community alarms are being turned down by up to 10% of those who are being charged for it, it means people not only have access to community alarms to help them when they fall, they lose access to things like fall clinics, which teach them how not to fall because they're no longer part of the social work system. We think that there, should be a, a, there, there could be a request to, NHS, to the NHS part of that, actually asking what effect social care charges has on both bed blocking and the access to preventative services and emergency admission into the healthcare system. And we think that the NHS could play a useful part in helping us understand perhaps some of the consequences of local authority actions on them further down the line. So, thank you uh, very much for that. Well, we now come to the stage where we're looking at uh, decision making. So we finished the questions. Um, I, I'm sure my committee colleagues will agree with me. This is a very, very important um, petition indeed. Clearly, we want to get the view of Scottish Government. And obviously, there's a role for health and local government. Uh, my own view would be, I think this is um, a particularly interesting one to get uh, the relevant cabinet secretary along to speak to us in the future. And we can maybe cover Jackie Bailey's point, which is to determine with the respective cabinet secretary whether they're satisfied with the current legal position, uh, because it would be, uh, be interesting to get the Scottish government's legal view on whether they're compliant with various European legislation, which is Dr Nolan's point. Uh, so I would certainly um, suggest that, and obviously getting the view of NHS Scotland and COSLA, but I'm sure my colleagues will have other suggestions. Uh, Chip Brody? You know, just the, 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 what I'd like to see is the exercise of the <coughs> COSLA working group uh, to produce, if it is as circular as, as Jackie Bailey said, and I'm, uh, as she knows, in favour of decentralising government to local authorities, uh, that it's, it's broader than just the charging. I have a circumstance in in, in South Asia, where we're not getting best value because of competitive tendering and the lowering of charges, and what's driving, you know, for example, continuity of care, which is important for dementia sufferers, for example, is 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 being lost in this uh, whole charging mechanism. I'm not sure we're getting most efficient in best value. So, uh, I'd like to encourage the cause of the working group to come up with a, what their outcomes are going to be and when they're going to achieve them. And presumably we could incorporate that in any letter to Scottish Government Minister, um, sure. as well as COSLA directly, of course. John Wilson? Mayor, could I take on board Jackie Bailey's suggestion that we write to EHRC to ask them their views in terms of the charging mechanisms, and also the witnesses made reference to the situation 
and whether or not this is in line with European guidance. Uh, could I also suggest when we write to COSLA and particularly the working group to find out uh, what the estimated total cost of providing care, uh, covering care charges in Scotland, uh, because Ms Bailey made a reference to a figure of £50 million uh, being an insignificant amount of money to the Scottish Government's overall budget. But I would like to get clarification uh, from the working group as to what is the actual total amount collected by local authorities in Scotland or uh, the perception of what would be collected in the coming years in terms of care charges that are made at the present time. So just so we can get clarification about what would be the actual cost to cover the, the delivery of these services. But convener, as well as writing to COSLA, I think it would be appropriate to write to a couple of local authorities. And we've heard a number of authorities mentioned by the witnesses today in relation to the charging levels that are made. And I think it might be useful if we, we go through the list that is produced by Mr Hood and try and pick out a couple of the highest and a couple of the lowest and ask them to justify uh, the charging regimes that are in place so that we get a better understanding of why the charges may be so high in one local authority but a lot lower in another local authority because we may not get that uh, from the COSLA working group or that detail from the COSLA working group. I agree with that. And, um, I think Jackie Bailey mentioned Nagail and Butte, and I think Mr Hood mentioned Murray. Uh, uh, it might be useful to approach them, not just because they're my region, but because I'm quite interested in the high cost as well. Uh, David Torrance. Uh, convener, I'm happy to go along with the recommendations. Uh, thank you. Amber Taggart. Thanks, Convener. Um, it concerns me somewhat that we're now 12 years on and nothing seems to be shown about, well, there's nothing amicable um, delivered here. It also has raised a concern that not all local authorities are within COSLA, Convener, so to be right out with to the, the local authorities who aren't part of that group. Um, and what proportion of that 50, is it 50, 000, 50 million or 56 million would be proportioned to the NHS? Could I ask for their views on that? Thank you for that. Thanks, McDonald. Yeah, thanks, Convener. <coughs> um, could I also ask that uh, we write to Falkirk Council because I think it was Mr Adamson who mentioned that there's a, a f over £500 difference between the, the figures in Midlothian and the figures in Falkirk, so it would be good to add them into the, 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 the list as well. Yeah, ask about the... Thank you for that. Uh, Jackson Carlock. Uh, in the letter we sent to the Scottish Government, can I draw a distinction between deferring the charging system to COSLA and abdicating all further responsibility for seeking to motivate it towards some sort of a conclusion. I would quite like to know what the Scot... Rather than them telling us, uh, which they might just do, that this committee exists, I would quite like to know what the Scottish Government's view is about the lack of progress and what um, consideration they've given to, um, to achieving some, because what they deferred, they could always uh, decide that they needed to take a slightly more direct interventionist view to drive to a conclusion. And I would be interested to know in a way, why they've chosen not to do that and for how long they would think not doing so would be acceptable. So. Thank, thank you for that. Um, so the, the initial suggestion um, I had was that we don't just write to the Scottish Government, we actually invite the relevant government secretary in. Obviously, there's a balance between health and local government. It looks like health is the main driver. Um, so obviously, Alec Neil would be the relevant minister. Just confirming that the committee members are happy that we invite Mr Neil to come here and give evidence at a future meeting. Uh, John Wilson? <laughs> Commissioner, could I ask that we seek clarification from the Scottish Government about who they would think would be the best to represent the Scottish Government's view on this? Because when you talk about local government budgets, then it's under a different portfolio when you talk about health budgets. And I think we need to be clear about what portfolio this, that if we were to take on Jackie Bailey's uh, suggestion and uh, the, part, the petitioner's suggestion about abolishing care charges, about who, what budget would that come from, uh, or what budget would be the, ma the majority of that funding would come from, because I think we need to be clear, because there's no point in getting sure. the health sector and the finance sector 
uh, batting at between each other, saying we're not responsible for this element, and them saying we're not responsible for that well, element. So it's I think that's a reasonable point. We'll ask um, the, the clerk to liaise with uh, Scottish government officials to get the relevant uh, and appropriate cabinet secretary. So that's fairly easy to sort out. Uh, Chip Brody and then Amit yeah, Tiger. Yeah. Um, <coughs> on the basis of the working group, which I don't wish to focus. Well, I do wish to focus on. Um, it might be all be worth while getting the convener along as well. Yes, that, that's a very good point. And in terms of local authorities, to give a steer to uh, the clerk, I think we mentioned um, higher cost local authorities, which um, were Murray, uh, Agile and Butte and Falkirk. Um, are members happy that we write to these three? Thank you for that. And there was also the points that John Wilson made about uh, EHRC, uh, which is really important. Amit Taggart? But also to remind ourselves the point that Jackie Bailey did make is that we are, we are at a crossroads just now about a new system coming into place um, and I think it's a, an ideal opportunity for us to be reviewing that. I think that summarised all the points um, that we were recommending. Can I, uh, can I finally thank our th three witnesses, um, uh, Mr Anderson, Mr Hood and Dr Nolan for giving evidence. It was very, very helpful indeed. And can I thank Jackie Bailey for also coming along and for her very uh, appropriate comments. Uh, it was very helpful in the committee uh, del deliberations. Obviously, we'll be taking this away and having it back at future agenda. The clerks will keep you up to date when this is on scheduled. Um, you're obviously welcome to be in the gallery, and we can lay about timings for that uh, with you. So, thanks very much for coming along. I suspend for two minutes till our witnesses to swap round. The third new petition today is PE 1534 by Claire Simmons on behalf of the Planning Democracy on Equal Rights of Appeal in the Planning System. Members of a note by the clerk, spice briefing and the petition. Could I welcome the petitioner, Claire Simmons, uh, who is chair, and Helen McDade, the committee member, Planning Democracy, uh, to the meeting. Uh, and just for the record, um, I've dealt with Helen McDade in various other petitions over the last few years. Could I invite uh, Ms Simmons to speak to the petition for a maximum of five minutes? I'll kick off with some questions and invite my fellow committee members to speak. Claire Simmons. Thank you. Is uh, Planning Democracy is an organisation who advocate on behalf of hundreds of communities we have heard from in the course of our research, our case studies, seminars, conference, and through people who have contacted us or been passed on to us from other organisations. We represent a voice that is seldom heard in discourses in planning issues the voice of citizens whose lives have been affected by planning decisions or who have sought to engage in the planning system. We are calling for equality in planning. We believe there is a moral imperative to grant an equal right of appeal to communities and individuals acting in the public interest. We question what other aspect of life is there such inequality, where one stakeholder has rights whilst another does not. The current system is prejudice against the citizens of Scotland whose lives are impacted by planning decisions. And in what democratic world is this justifiable? So why are we asking for equal rights now? Well, the passing of the 2006 Planning Act was hailed by the Scottish Government as strengthening opportunities for democratic engagement in planning system. 
However, an equal right of appeal was not granted to communities. Delay was cited as a major concern about equal rights, while ministers complained, uh, claimed that there was plenty of opportunities for communities to be involved at earlier stages in the planning process through the front-loading of community involve, uh, involvement. However, eight years after the major rehaul of the planning system, our research shows that the new system is not working for citizens in Scotland. People do not feel listened to when it comes to key development decisions. The, better, the promises of better participation are not working in practice. The lack of an, un, an equal right to appeal is seen by communities as one of the most unpopular and unjust aspects of the planning system currently. Exhausted, isolated, anguished, traumatised, frustrated, baffled, depressed, rejected, raw and wounded. These are the words that have been used by ordinary people to describe their experience of democratic planning in Scotland. The words are shockingly emotive and seem better to describe the feelings of someone exposed to civil war or extreme ill health than those of responsible citizens taking part in one of society's democratic opportunities. Yet these emotive terms are not unusual. We have spoken to many individuals who describe their feelings in such a way. We know there's lots of dissatisfaction. We have our own evidence for it. But is anyone interested in hearing the voice of Scottish citizens? Certainly we have found no evidence of government reports or reviews that ask these stakeholders how the planning reforms are working. There is very little information documenting the citizen side of the story. We ask for a thorough review into the planning reforms from the public perspective. Government and professional organisations tend to stress the problems of equal rights of appeal rather than seek a system, a type of system that could work and address clear public desire to have some form of equal rights. We would like to emphasise that there is not a dichotomy of equal rights or no equal rights but a wide range of possibilities in between. Debate in the planning system seems to be entirely focused on the agenda set by developers, for example, speed and efficiency, rather than the quality of outcomes of decision-making. We have been advised that the right of appeal to appeal system in Ireland, where it's called third-party right of appeal, has enhanced the Irish uh, planning system. There is clear evidence that equal rights has not detrimentally impacted the economy. There are no border effects with Northern Ireland to show that developers would build elsewhere to avoid a third party right of appeal. The Irish economy was absolutely bo booming in early 2000 with TPRA as a key element of the planning system. We have seen evidence to demonstrate improved de uh, decision making where weak proposals have been strengthened and enhanced through the appeal system. Following the property crash in 2008, there have been a number of far-reaching reviews and inquiries in the, uh, onto the uh, Irish system. And these have pointed to the failure of overall regulation, overzoning, etc. But none have suggested that the system of third-party right of appeal be reformed. And this has come out of the failures of the system with its integrity. We're actually with the five minutes. Are you just about at your I am. Um, last sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'd like to finish in the words of uh, John McBride, who's a consultant planning inspector with uh, the Irish board that oversees uh, planning appeals. He says, my Irish casework included a fair number of third party appeals. They were all of some planning cogency and merit and none were of the frivolous, vexatious or venal nature often characterized by opponents of the system in the UK. I look forward to the time when a political party in Great Britain takes a leaf out of Ireland's book planning democracy hopes that we will be the first to follow in Ireland, Ireland's footsteps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your, your statement. I have a couple of questions and I'll bring my colleagues in. Um, those that support third party right of appeal have argued that in Scotland we have a gap in that we currently uh, are breaching the Aarhus Convention and also European Convention of Human Rights. What's your argument about that particular viewpoint? Do you want to take that one? 
Um, Hillary did. Yeah, there certainly is evidence that it's unlikely that Scotland is Aarhus compliant. Um, there have been several complaints have been to the Aarhus Compliance Committee. Uh, we're not experts on them, but my understanding is that some of that was upheld. And certainly um, the trust that I work for is about to put in a complaint to Aarhus on our planning system. Not necessarily specifically about equal rights of appeal, but that would probably have um, resolved the, the problem at an earlier stage. So I, I think there's no doubt that many of the groups which have been involved in, in dispute on planning um, have gone forward and are taking forward complaints. And one, we had a, a previous petition which was concerned about a series of minor developments which suddenly became a major development. Um, is that something that concerns you in the planning process? Certainly we have got uh, case studies, um, particularly uh, ones down in Canonbury, uh, down in uh, Dumfries and Galloway, where um, uh, there have been uh, quite uh, about 20 um, small applications were put forward um, for the exploration and development of coal bed methane, um, and they were divided up into small batches. But we think uh, possibly it, uh, you know, together, cumulatively, they should be a um, major development. So um, we believe that there are quite a number of these kind of cases, and of course this would be a situation where um, an equal right of appeal would be uh, suitable. And finally, just to, to give some balance in my comments, you'll know that the CBI Scotland and the Scottish Chambers of, uh, of uh, on Scotland have said that they think third party right of appeal will undermine economic investment in Scotland. What's your view on that? I'll go back to, um, you know, look at Ireland. Uh, the the uh, proof there is, uh, is that it hasn't had an effect on the economy. Um, we have spoken to um, several people from Ireland. Geraint Ellis uh, um, from Queen's uh, University Belfast has done quite a lot of research in this and he assures us that there's been no uh, impact on the economy. In fact, it's uh, booming. Uh, Helen McDade? Yeah. I'd just like to add to that that very often it is said that... Um, objection um, or challenging a planning decision is what's holding up um, major planning uh, developments and uh, major developments going forward. Very often when you look at those individual developments, there are major other issues such as finance um, or indeed there isn't the evidence that is being held up. But actually, um, in a way, that's almost an argument for ERA because judicial review is long, complex um, and expensive and people have only got that option at the moment and, and they do take it. So obviously there is a position you could take where nobody has a right of appeal. You could consider that uh, to equalise the playing field and that would really speed up the planning system. Whether it would get us the right results is a different matter. Thank you. Thank you for that. And just to confirm for the record, my reference was of course to Scottish uh, Chambers of Commerce, not, Ch not Chambers of Scotland tonight. Chip Brody. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> Just to follow on that point, um, last week the, we had the Business in Parliament conference. In fact, I chaired a session in this very room uh, talking about uh, business in the communities. And planning came up. And I'm afraid they disavow the issue about that you suggest that, uh, and I know something of Ireland as well, uh, having done business there, uh, that they, they disavow the view that... Um, appeals such as this, anything that prolongs the planning process uh, will impact uh, economic development. And they gave very good uh, indications by I mean, setting businesses against businesses, having you know, one business complain about another business and undermining uh, competitive investment. Now, I'm not saying that the whole thing should focus on business, but there are facilities within the, within the planning a process for uh, through objections, I think, things like the environmental impact assessment that they have to go through, as we've seen in, in uh, some of the cases that we've, we've uh, discussed before, uh, Helen. So, you know, I just wonder how, how much in Ireland is not, I think, a good case, how much discussion you've actually had in, with, with the likes of local businesses and rural businesses uh, as to what you're proposing, the impact it would have democracy doesn't have the resources that the government has to do the research on this and we would really welcome um, detailed research on this. To take your specific example um, about business against businesses, of course they can already do that. They have the resources to take judicial review. Um, 
in fact, what we see is that the people who don't have those resources are local communities or indeed um, often non-government organisations. Um, so the system already allows for, and there are a lot of judicial reviews ongoing at the moment, Fine. mainly... Fine. I don't know, but... Um, you find there are a handful in terms of business and kind of business. Well, that's not my understanding, and I'll certainly come back to you on that. We'll, okay. we'll put that in. But we would really welcome figures either from the, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce or the RTPI, um, any of these organisations, if they've done detailed research, um, you know, showing that that difficulty would come up. Uh, that, I mean, I could mention many major cases which are actually under judicial review at the moment and have been held up for two or three years, whereas if it, we had equal rights of appeal, these local people who had no right to say anything after an initial written objection until going to judicial review... Um, they would, those cases would be over and quite likely those businesses might have won and that would be developed by now. Okay, Chair Purdy, thank you. I can invite other colleagues who wish to ask questions. Angus MacDonald and then John Wilson. Thanks, Convener. Um, in 2006, I, I served on the, or I was serving on the local planning committee in, in my local authority. Um, and uh, I have to admit that uh, when, when third party right of appeal was removed, uh, I, I certainly had concerns, as did the, the, the whole council group. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sure we're all keen to see improvements in the way applicants, local communities, the wider public and planning authorities engage in the existing planning system. Um, and while the government has tried to streamline uh, development planning processes and appeal proceedings, these actions, I would argue, are based on the assumption that uh, local authorities or local planning committees are actually following their own local development plans. And unfortunately, in some cases, that, uh, that isn't always the case. So would you agree that the local failures or perceptions of, of local failures in the planning system uh, do require a third-party right of appeal uh, to ensure a proper balance with the, the planning system? Yes, I would, I would uh, agree heartily because I think... Um, there are two aspects of the planning system. We can look at the efficiency, but we, you know, the, the planning reforms were also about improving public engagement in planning. And if, if, if a, the public don't have some sort of certainty that the, the um, applications are going to be in compliant with the local development plan, well, what incentive is there for them to get engaged at the early side of the process? And we have case studies of people who have genuinely, people from um, communities that are affected by landfill and... Um, uh, um, coal mining um, who've, who've had to engage with the planning system and have done so, you know, really well. There's so much so that, in fact, the, the Scottish government cited them as an example. Um, and they, they put in months and months of work, working very closely with local development plan teams um, to get in um, particular areas. Um, I've, I've forgotten what it was called, but... Um, uh, and they were successful in, 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 in their, uh, it was uh, to the Clyde, uh, Glasgow and Clyde Valley structure plans and the local uh, development plans. And they got rural investment areas uh, incorporated, only to find out later after um, the plan was uh, uh, published that uh, a developer who circumnavigated the plan entirely came in with a, an application for a, an incinerator, which was uh, totally contrary to this. And, uh, and that was given... Uh, a permission. So, what incentive then is there? You know, what, what, how, how do they feel that all their hard work, you know, where had that gone? So, I think it's uh, when we talk about having a, a, a plan-led system and public engagement, um, a third-party right of appeal or an equal right of appeal can really enhance the front, the front-loading and the, and the engagement at the earlier stages. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John Wilson. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, it's just to take on the issue. There is a right of appeal at the present moment that currently exists in terms of planning decisions and that right of appeal is to the courts uh, could you give an indication what in, in your experience what the average cost of taking an appeal to the courts would be um, I, I don't want to be too exact because I, I don't know that um, that's something we want to um, put out in the public domain but this John Muir Trust uh, who I work for we are currently engaged in that process and we haven't even got to the first court hearing and our spending's well into six figures um, it's 
totally underestimated by the legal and planning profession and politicians what it costs to actually go forward. Now, we may not have to spend all that money because if we win the case, we can get costs from the other side. But you don't know that till you get there. And going back to Mr Brodie's point about the environmental impact assessment, sadly, um, I can't think of many successful cases that have been taken forward um, on the public interest and the environment um, by such organisations that win. You know, our chances are already not really very even. So we have to have that money to go forward. So I think the costs are incredibly underestimated, and that's one of the major points. Now, we're an organisation, a medium-sized organisation. For local groups to do this, it's just phenomenal that they manage to raise the money locally um, to go forward to, into this system. It's, it's frightening. I was in court a few weeks ago watching our, this process start. And I'm just doing it for work, and you know, I have a lot of experience of these sort of confrontational situations. It's very unpleasant. So public local inquiry you know, has its deficiencies, but it's vastly better than judicial review. Yeah, for a response. My understanding uh, and what I've been told is the average cost is roughly £50,000 for someone to get to the courts, uh, because it, locally, uh, in one of the areas I represent, uh, fortunately, a local community group got the local authority to support them and funded a court action. Uh, we have also had a situation uh, within three miles of where I live of the, exactly the, the scenario Ms Simmons gave in terms of a developer, after going through the local plan, going through the strategic plan, uh, a developer who bypassed that whole process then submitted an application to build 540 houses completely with the local plan, which was then approved. How do we build confidence? Because it's not just about appeals. How do we build confidence in the planning process and the engagement process that would make local communities feel their views valued in terms of, and as, as I said, is it just appeals? Is it just a third party rate of appeal? Or is there something else lacking in the current legislation that prohibits uh, full engagement by communities in the planning process? Um, well, I think, I think one of the things that we lack is evidence, um, and this is one of the things we would ask for, that people, that the, the government do go and ask people who've used the planning system, you know, what they would, how they feel about it and, and, and help them to identify um, the, the, the problems. But certainly um, one of the things that they, that's not measured, and I think Audit Scotland uh, came up with this that, um, in, in their report a couple of years ago, to say that, you know, look at the qualitative as well as the quantitative, because a lot of things are just measured by whether or not you've advertised something um, uh, or, or whether you've held a public meeting. But it doesn't say whether or not uh, those, vo those views were listened to or whether or not they actually have Im Im influenced the, the development plan. So I think that's one aspect. Kavir, the next question, and one of the things that I'm concerned about is we, we heard mention of the Section 75 restrictions that may be applied. We heard about the environmental impact assessments that may have to be carried out. In planning democracy's view or evidence, do you have any indication of the number of objections beyond the planning decision that are made regarding the Section 75 conditions not being adhered to or the envi environmental impact assessments not being fully carried out before uh, the developer goes ahead, because it is an issue about trying to make sure that all the processes are in place. And I know that certainly in terms of the Section 75 uh, conditions, are in many occasions at a local level, are completely ignored by developers and are given the sanction to go ahead by the local planning departments. Yes, um, I'm not so sure about the Section 75, but certainly conditions on, on planning uh, applications, which is what, after all, makes a planning ap uh, application acceptable to a community. And certainly that was one of the things, the lack of enforcement that goes on um, was, uh, was when we were first starting out with our research was something that came up very, very strongly, particularly uh, with mining communities and, and communities perhaps whose voice is, is, is not heard as, as uh, vocally as, say, like uh, some of the... Um, high-profile things such as Craig House decision. Uh, in, um, but these, these, these uh, communities who, um, 
you know, living in um, areas that are quite deprived and so on, and they're finding that their lives have been made quite intolerable by the lack of um, enforcement of, of conditions leading to sort of um, anything from blasting going on at the bottom of their gardens at six o'clock in the morning to, uh, um, you know, traffic going past uh, hundreds of lorries and so on. So I think indeed uh, enforcement is a, is a big issue. Uh, I'm afraid we're a bit short of time. We've got asked those very short questions and answers. Jackson Carlow. Thank you. I wonder if you could just help me with a deficiency in my knowledge. Who are planning democracy? How are you constituted? How are you funded? And who do you formally represent? We are a charity. Uh, we've been going five years. Um, we represent, as I said, the, the, the voice of the people, um, which is, is going into hundreds and thousands now of the people who come to us um, through uh, our, our email, through our contacts, through um, other organisations. We're part of Scottish Environment Link, for, ex for example. And, uh, so those are the voices. Uh, we're not a membership organisation. Uh, we have no staff. We're entirely voluntary. Um, and I think that's probably about us. <laughs> uh, how are you funded? We don't have any funding. You don't have any funding. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's grants, small grants um, for a conference. Um, well, that's about it, isn't it? Yeah. It's enti almost entirely voluntary right. at the moment. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Unless any members got any urgent questions, I'm afraid we're out of time. So, as you will know from your previous experience, we're finished with questions now. We're going to summation. So, if you just give us a few minutes, we are now looking at next steps. Clearly, it's an an important uh, petition to ask Scottish Government his views on. So I would suggest we write to Scottish Government Planning Aid for Scotland uh, and the Real Town Planning Institute for Scotland to get their views on the petition. Can I ask members' views, Chick Brody, on the next steps? Well, I think the, the, the other thing is, is to consider <coughs> writing to heads of planning in, in some local authorities uh, just to, to get their view of how this might be implemented or, or not. Right, yes. Thank you for that. Um, John Wilson? Could I suggest we write to Homes for Scotland as the trade body for uh, many of the housing developers in Scotland uh, to fight, get their views on how they see this right of appeal uh, would uh, sit within the current process. But I'd also like to, and I would normally suggest write to John Muir Trust, but given her updates here today, there's, there's no point in writing to John Muir Trust. Could I suggest we write to the Scottish Wildlife Trust and ask them their views? Uh, because I know they, they've been involved in some issues and I have to declare my membership of the Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, here. Uh, so the, just to try and get a balance in terms of some of the environmental organisations' experience apart from uh, the planning democracy. Uh, but I think it would be important to hear from Homes of Scotland. That. Dave Torrance. I think we'll yeah, for to continue the petition and write to some of the people that have been listed. Um, convener, um, the Scottish Government, the Royal Town Planning Institute, Planning Aid for Scotland, and Heads of Planning for Scotland. Is that Angus MacDonald? Content with the suggested contact. Jackson Carlock. Content at this yeah. stage. Um, thanks very much, and as you've heard, we are uh, pursuing your petition actively in all these various areas. It will be scheduled in a future meeting, and the clerks will let you know when it is. Clearly, if you wish to come along and be in the gallery, that's perfectly possible. And can thank you both for the evidence that you've given today. It's been very helpful to the committee, so can thank Helen McDade and Claire Simmons for both coming along. And uh, because we're short of time, I'll just move quickly to the next item. So thank you very much for your time and attention today. I uh, can move quickly to the fourth and final new petition is PE1532 by Gary Stagg on stopping public bearing of arms by the police. Members of a note by the clerk, the spice briefing, the petition, a submission from the petitioner. Uh, the petitioner has indicated that he no longer wishes to proceed with the petition. On that basis, uh, I firmly move that we agree that the petition now be closed. Uh, John Wilson. Just to on the record for clarification, Camina, once the petition has been submitted, petition becomes the property of this committee, not the property of the petitioner. So it's just to, to formally acknowledge that even though the, in this instance the petitioner has asked for the petition to be withdrawn and the committee is happy to do that, the formal process is once it's submitted it does become the property of this committee. Yeah, 
Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I move to agenda item two, consideration of current petitions. The next item is consideration of nine current petitions. The first two petitions we'll be taking together is PE1098 by Lynn Merrifield on behalf of Kingsley Community Council and PE1223 by Ron uh, Beattie on school bus safety. And uh, I note Mr. Beattie's in the gallery again, and I thank Mr. Beattie for all the efforts he's done uh, over the years in this uh, petition. Members, uh, if I note by the clerk, um, I know Stuart Stevenson's had a long-standing interest in the petition. I don't think he's able to be here today, but nevertheless, I'll note uh, Mr. Stevenson's uh, interest. Um, I would suggest then there's two, uh, there's options for each petition in relation to PE 1098. Uh, the committee may wish to defer further consideration into early 2015 and seek an update from the Scottish Government on the progress of the devolution of powers relating to seatbelt provision at that stage. Is that agreeable? It's agreeable, but uh, you know, I said what I said you know, two weeks ago about you know, speeding up this whole process. I mean, yeah, I'll be 125 by the time this, this comes forward. Yeah. That's next year. Um, we really need to get an understanding that you know, the petitioners spend a lot of time yeah. bringing this forward, and this uh, has been going on almost forever. So. Yeah. Perhaps in the letter to Transport Scotland, we might uh, press upon them that we want to come to a conclusion on this. Right. I think Mr. Brody's frustration is felt by all the committee. Angus MacDonald. With regard to a pilot being undertaken in the in a rural a local authority area, um, you know, is there any? I mean, clearly, the, the the reason that they're holding back is given the the current financial situation. Um, is there any way of suggesting? And it's probably not within our remit, but. It wouldn't any harm to suggest that perhaps Transport Scotland could cover the cost of a pilot. Right, right. You know, if that, if that seems to be the, the sticking point. Sure. Um, would the committee, are the committee agreeable that we write to Transport Scotland in terms yeah. of Angus MacDonald? Thank you very much. And in relation to PE1223, the committee may wish to write again to Transport Scotland regarding the views of the petitioner uh, and, a and ATCO Scotland that a rural local authority should take part in the pilot scheme on enhanced signage. Uh, John Wilson. I agree we should write to Transport Scotland again, but I, I would uh, want to draw Transport Scotland's uh, attention to the submission made by Ron Beatty, uh, in particular the way that the consultation took place as expressed by Mr Beatty. I think when this committee makes a recommendation to a public agency to engage with the petitioners, I think we mean meaningful engagement. We don't mean uh, in a cafe uh, where no notes are taken. And, and I think Mr Beatty's description of being in a public cafe trying to discuss the issues uh, that are of concern uh, is not adequate. Uh, and given his description that they, they then went into a meeting in the council uh, offices, I think that should have been afforded to the petitioners as well, the, the same rights. And I think Transport Scotland should be made aware that when we talk about consultation with petitioners, we talk about meaningful consultation in an appropriate place, an appropriate time and consideration given to the views of the petitioners being expressed. Are committee happy we write to Transport Scotland in these terms? Yeah. And are committee agreeable with my earlier suggestion about PE 1223? Yeah. Right, thank, and can again thank Mr Beattie for his time and commitment. I think the Petitions yeah. Committee acknowledge all the work he's done over the years. Yeah. Um, the next petition is PE1431 by Nick uh, Riddeford on behalf of the Fair Island community on the marine protected area for Fair Isle. Members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, a possible course of action for the committee is when we wish to defer again further consideration of this petition until early next year and seek further information from Marine Scotland on the outcome of the assessment of Fair Isle's demonstration and research proposal at that stage. Agreed. Thank you for that. Um, the next is a petition is PE 1493 by uh, Peter John Gordon on a Sunshine Act for Scotland. Members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Uh, a possible option for action, of course, is that given information provided by the Scottish Government detailing the measures put in place by individual health boards and the concerns highlighted by the petition in this regard, that the committee uh, may wish to write again to the Scottish Government to ascertain what action has been taken since this information was gathered to ensure that guidance in the NHS HDL 2003-62 has been complied with fully and consistently by all health boards in Scotland. Thank you for that. 
And the next petition is PE 1506 by Alison Tate on behalf of the Robert Burns World Federation Limited on renaming Glasgow Presco Airport to Robert Burns International Airport. Um, members have a note by the clerk and submissions uh, can invite Chick Brodie uh, to make opening statement. Uh, obviously, I will not agree with the recommendation of the petition uh, committee. It will be largely because of my involvement with Presswick Airport. Uh, I think the first thing we have to do is drop the Glasgow Presswick. Uh, it's in Presswick, in Ayrshire. Um, and it's quite interesting that we are asking to rename Presswick as Robert Burns International Airport, which we can't do apparently, while we sit in a committee room called the Robert Burns Committee Room. Um, I suspect that the, commission, the committee will wish to uh, close the petition uh, with the imminent announcement of the board of Presswick. Uh, I can assure you this uh, will roll on, um, but I suspect uh, there is no point in continuing the argument, um, although I will continue it, but no point in continuing the argument within the committee. Okay. I mean, obviously, I understand, uh, Mr. Bode, you will continue ind individually. Yep. Um, sure is, the com is the committee minded then to close the petition in light of the Scottish Government's view, or is there an alternative view from committee? John Wilson? The, the difficulty convenient is that, like Mr. Brody, I'm loath to close this petition uh, because I think that it, it, the justification for the decision of the board, I don't think, has been made. I, the as far as I'm aware, they haven't tested the market in terms of the, the renaming of the airport. Uh, we know, and uh, the, the feedback we're getting from other airports that have re renamed uh, or rebranded themselves, is that they see those rebranding exercises as being a major success uh, for the popularity of the airports and actually brought in more carriers into those airports. And it, I would... I would have liked to have seen more evidence coming forward from the Presswick Board and the Scottish Government to show us what they have done to actually test the market, not only in Scotland, but test the market internationally, because we, we do have to retain Prestwick Airport as an important hub in, uh, for not only Scotland, but for the UK. But as I said, I would have preferred to have seen more clear evidence from the Scottish Government and the Board uh, on this issue. Thanks, Convener. Um, could I ask, I, I mean, obviously the committee has done a power of work within this, but um, can I ask, is there anything else that Mr Brodie may well see fit that should be, con why it should be continued? I mean, I think, first, first of all, the name Glasgow Presswick Airport uh, was adopted largely because one carrier who uh, wanted to call uh, Bovey Airport Paris, although it takes you 45 minutes to get from one to, to, from Bovey to Paris. I think I would, because of my involvement in, in you know, I spent almost all this weekend at Bristol Airport in terms of business opportunities, but um, I w clearly would like this to continue. It's quite instructive, I think, that if you look, uh, I think it was last week, that Edinburgh are now asking that Edinburgh Airport be called Robert Louis Stevenson Airport. So uh, the evidence and the discussions I've had with chief executives in Liverpool, in Belfast, and what have you, is that the naming, although not greatly important, has, uh, has ramifications. And the fact that Burns is, uh, is translated into, well, and, and produced in 159 countries worldwide suggests to me that uh, there's a real marketing opportunity. However, uh, I'll say no more. Thanks, Mr. Dalt. So, I certainly take on board what uh, uh, Chick Brody is saying, but uh, we have to, well, I have to re reluctantly accept uh, the recommendation to close the petition. It's clear the Scottish Government aren't going to budge uh, on the issue. Um, however, I wish Chick Brody um, success in his future endeavours. Jackson Carlow, do you have any? Suggestions? Oh. Uh, well, since we last met, we did write to the Cabinet Secretary again, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, very soon she who must be obeyed, um, and she replied saying, we have considered very carefully the suggestion that the airport be renamed Robert Burns International. On balance, we have decided that there are strong commercial reasons to retain the Glasgow Prestwick name, but the importance of recognising the rich legacy of Burns is accepted. Therefore, the government that now owns the airport has said it's not going to change the name, the management committee they have appointed to run the airport has concluded that they won't change the name, and I therefore cannot see what 
as a committee, we believe is yet to be achieved. And therefore, whatever the strength of opinion that underpins the petition, it's clear it's not going to proceed any further. And on that basis, I think, whilst individuals, of course, will pursue the matter, um, we couldn't really have stronger or clearer grounds on which to close it. For clarification, yeah. the management committee have not been involved because the board has not yet been appointed. Who knows well, what will happen yeah, after that? I'm, anyway. I'm reluctant to open a sort of free-for-all debate on this. Um, I think members have all discussed this. I think Mr. Carla had a very strong no there, if I picked that up correctly. Um, I do, you know, I think we all respect the work that Chip Brody has been carrying out on an individual basis, but I, I, I do, uh, I can't see any other option bar to close the petition, particularly in light of yeah. Mr. Carlo's points. Um, as I think all committee members bar one have effectively said that, so reluctantly we're closing the petition because of the position of the, the Scottish Government, but we all wish Mr Brodie well in his endeavours and an individual basis. The next petition is PE 1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish Mesh Survivors, Hear Our Voice, Campaign on Mesh Medical Devices. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, I think we all recognise that I think this has been a first-class um, petition. And I know we've got a number of supporters in the gallery today, and I welcome them back. And I also put in record thanks to Neil Finlay, who's carried out, I think, a, a very strong campaign on this particular issue, and particularly the work that the Sunday Mail has carried out. Um, there is obviously a suggestion that we defer consideration of this petition to early 2015 to await the outcome of the independent review set up by the Scottish Government and the opinion of the scientific community on emerging and newly identified health risks requested by the European Commission. But before we make a final decision, obviously, first of all, I want to hear from any committee members who wish to speak on that point. Yes, uh, if I may, want to? convener, um, despite what some people think in terms of uh, members of the government backbenches, I, I, in, in items 12 and 13, we had the, uh, I can't remember when the cabinet secretary was here, but it was made quite clear what action had to be taken. Uh, and I'm... Yeah, not concerned, probably more than that, that uh, since June 2014, I acknowledge what Mr Finlay has done, um, that 29 women have received mesh devices from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Now, I thought the uh, decision of the Cabinet Secretary was very clear, uh, and therefore I'm surprised the Minister for Public Health said that there will be individual circumstances where clinicians in consultation with the women involved will consider all the potential risk factors. Uh, I think I'd like... To understand that, mm. what, what, what the basis of that is? Yeah. Right, Minister. Th thank Mr. Brody for his comments. Um, that's certainly something I'm sure we could write specifically to the Health Cabinet Secretary about. Uh, Jackson Carlow? Sorry, can I echo that? Because actually, when we did take um, evidence, uh, I think that the committee at the meeting at which that evidence was presented was largely assuaged on the assurance that the Cabinet Secretary had given that he had uh, instructed a moratorium be placed. Now, I think he, he did explain the limitations on him from that, but I, I felt that the response of the Chamber to the question that was put um, was somewhat cavalier in uh, its generality, and um, I think that we had expected something a little bit more absolute from the assurances that have been given to us. Can I also say that I think we should acknowledge the uh, public recognition that have been given to the petitioners uh, in terms of the recognition they've received for this work, but I believe also that as a consequence of what they have been doing, the Department of Health uh, at the, in the government at Westminster has now taken an interest in this issue. And I think as we continue to review the petition, it would be interesting to note what um, their conclusions have been and how that might yet uh, have an effect on the position that we adopt and pursue here in Scotland. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we're obviously still part of the European Commission, so it's a European community, so it's very useful to get the, their view on that as well. So I agree with that. Um, Amit Taggart. Thanks, Convener. And like um, Chick Brody, I am aghast because um, I was here and listening to the evidence that the Cabinet Secretary did give and the instruction that he gave so that the Keynesian tail wagging the dog um, springs to mind here. So I would like some more information with regards to that. Uh, if no other members wish to come well, in... I have, I have one other point. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to become a bore on this because... Check, yeah, it, we had a discussion two weeks ago on, on one particular element and how long it's taking. Um, I think we need to start asking those that advise ministers, um, not just when in early 2015 we'll see the outcome of this. I think we need to start asking for exactly when... Um, I mean, if I'm asked to 
to do something out of, you know, in business. So if, I was, if I was asked to do something, I couldn't say, well, I'll give you it in early next year. So I think there's an incumbency now to start asking, when are we going to see information? When are we going to see outcomes? What the outcomes are uh, so that we can uh, you know, promote the interests of those that bring petitions in front of us. Thank you for that. Can I bring in uh, Neil Finlay, who's been a champion of this particular issue? Mr Finlay. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, this is the uh, patient information leaflet uh, that's been produced um, uh, to run alongside uh, the current uh, trials that are ongoing. And it's the belief that, um, given the information or the lack of information in the leaflet, that people are actually uh, being in effect, hoodwinked into taking part in trials. Um, they are being asked to take part um, without knowing that they're having a mesh, they will have a mesh device fitted and without knowing that the, the procedures uh, have been suspended by the Scottish Government pending a safety review. Uh, and, and I think that is a very concerning situation. No mention in the leaflet of mesh uh, and since the, um, uh, this has started, we've seen the suspension in Scotland, or the alleged suspension in Scotland. We have a working group set up. We have a revised consent booklet uh, being created that should include the word mesh. And we've had products that have twice been found defective in the US courts. Uh, and we've also had the deputy um, chief medical officer, uh, one of the most senior medical officials in the country, encouraging women to take part in this trial. Now, we also, uh, since then, have had a, what I've probably got, two, two and a half pages of um, settlements, details of settlements in the US courts. 4th of March, 16 million, 3rd of April, 1.2 million, 5th of April, uh, 5th of September, sorry, 3.27 million, uh, 8th of September, 73.5 million, 30th of September, 1.6 billion, and 21st of October, 21 million, and it goes on and on and on. My concern is primarily for the women who are affected, but who may be affected if they go down the route of this trial and they are injured because of this product. But there's another concern, because these lawsuits are massive, and we know the numbers that have been uh, affected in Scotland. The consequences for our National Health Service are eye-watering if this goes the way that it happened in the US and is likely to go in Australia. Thank you very much for that. And perhaps you, you could leave the information you've quoted with our officials for yeah. the official record. Oh. Uh, the other point, just to make sure um, this is in the public record, is we are shortly, as a committee, going to Brussels and we made attempts to contact the EU Health Commissioner's Office to try and raise this specific um, issue. Uh, whilst we won't be able to have a meeting in the next few weeks when we go, we are assured that we will be able to meet as officials at some stage. And I think that's very important. We want to put this whole issue um, to bed because it's a crucial issue across the whole of Europe and, and America, as Neil Finlay has stated. So we will uh, give further information about that when, when we've had the meeting. Um, John Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just to, in the back of Neil Finlay's comments, I think one of the problems that we have, and it's been highlighted by the petitioners in their updated report, is the lack of certainty we have in the reporting mechanisms from health boards around Scotland, uh, because the petitioners have highlighted and some of the evidence provided, and I welcome the evidence that's been provided by health boards, but some of the evidence provided clearly indicates they do not keep or may not be keeping accurate records of where there have been incidents uh, where patients have reported uh, concerns about the devices that have been fitted. So there are concerns there, and, and I think the petitioners have raised the issue that does that include referrals to specialist services? Does it, no, does it include GP uh, referrals? Because in the BMA response... We actually say, no, the BMA actually says, the BMA recognises that many women have suffered complications following the insertion of a proper, properly meshed uh, medical device. The difficulty is, is that we don't accurately know because we, uh, due to the reporting mechanisms and who the patients then speak to after the operation, are they only speaking to their GPs? raising concerns there, or are they being referred back to the consultants that carried out the operation in the first instance? So it's really trying to impress upon the Scottish Government that we need to find accurate ways of measuring the level of 
operations that have now become complicated in later years or have become complicated immediately after the operation is carried out. So it would be useful just to try and get some clarification because if health boards aren't clear about the reporting mechanisms, then certainly we cannot be clear about the number of incidents that there have been in Scotland. Thank, thank you for that, Mr Wilson. Um, there was a specific point that Neil Finley raised about the future liability through court actions of the Scottish Government. Will members be agreeable that we actually make a specific reference to this to the Cabinet Secretary for Health? And I... And Sorry, Mr. Finlay. Raise a, a point just in your deliberations here. Um, there is the whole issue of um, this um, information leaflet and how it's provided to those who uh, may be considering or be being considered for the trial. And I think that's a major concern that people are being uh, approached about clinical trials without the full evidence. And I think that, I don't want to tell the committee what to do, but I think it may be uh, appropriate for, to write to the Scottish Government and the other agencies involved about this. I think there was a wider issue when we had the Minister about informed consent. And I think that's an issue that you're, you're raising on that point. Is it informed or not? Um, any other member wish well, to come I, in? I just one point to do, and, and I know this is live, so um, one of the, like, like Jackson Carlaw, my understanding, and, and Anne McTaggart was, there was to be a moratorium on this. The letter from uh, the Chief Executive of NHS Grampian, who I think is no longer with us, uh, to suggest that we, they avoid medical recommendations should be based on medical literature, high quality medical research focused on patient reported outcomes and clinical expertise. The last penultimate sentence is we must avoid basing any recommendations on the basis of media or political pressure. Well, anything that comes out of this committee, I believe, and I, I, I will you know, personally ensure that you know, the political pressure comes from those that come here with petitions. And if the balance of probability results mm -hmm. in a cabinet secretary announcing a moratorium, then the people who run the various health services should understand that is properly directed political pressure. Thank you. I think the wider point that I think Mr. Brody makes correctly is we've had several opportunities of petitions in the past where there has been quite a clear, well accepted Scottish Government policy which has not been fully implemented by various health boards. So this is, this is a common theme that we've raised time and time again. I'm conscious of time. Is there any other further points? I think our, our members think um, agreeable that we write to Scottish Government, uh, write to Scottish Health Cabinet Secretary about liability costs and about informed consent. And also we defer it until uh, 2015 to wait the opinion of the Scientific Committee of the Merging and Newly Identified Health Risks requested by the European Commission. Well, I, I want to know when. Well, can I just get John Wilson first? Could we add in to that convener, which I haven't read out, is the record, records that are being kept by health boards of incidents. Yes. Uh, because I think it's important we do get an accurate record or, and the patients who have, are suffering are able to make sh be ensured that they're actually <coughs> getting their issues heard and reported in the appropriate manner. Yeah, and can I thank you very much for the, that point. I'll add that to your, our list of objectives. And can I thank Neil Finley for coming along and giving us some evidence today, and also to all the supporters in the gallery who've come along again today. We're obviously with you in this uh, petition, and thanks for all the work you're doing in this, this area. Uh, if we move on to the next petition, it's PE 1521 by Gerald Tickleton and Jane O'Donnell on No More Page 3 in the Scottish Sun and the Scottish Parliament. Uh, members have a note uh, by the clerk and submissions. I think Jackie Bailey's got an interest in, in this issue as well. Can I first of all invite any uh, members of the committee who wish to raise any uh, specific points? There is obviously a couple of opportunities. Um, for example, we could write to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission asking for its views on the sale and availability of the Scottish Sun in the workplace uh, while it carries the Page 3 feature. Um, can I ask for any comments on that before I bring Jackie Bailey in? Are members happy with that as a course of action? Right, Jackie Bailey. Um, thank you very much, Convener. I, I am pleased the committee agree to write to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Um, I wonder whether I might encourage them, on the back of the letter from Gordon Smart, the editor of the Scottish Sun, whether the committee would also write to Rupert Murdoch, because in his letter he suggests that Rupert Murdoch is considering the future of page three, um, so this might be a timely intervention by the committee. Um, could I also just point out, um, unless 
I've read this wrong, there doesn't appear to be a response from the SNP group. Now, I don't know whether that's an oversight or not, but as the largest group within this parliament, I would have hoped to have um, seen a response from them, so that would give the committee an opportunity to chase that down. Um, and I just feel um, to let you know that since the last time you met, um, a complaint against the Sun was lodged with the Press Complaints Commission um, for the use of offering a date with a page three model as a prize in a contest organized by the paper. I'm pleased to say that the Press Complaints Commission upheld the complaint on the basis that it objectified women. So for all those reasons, I hope the committee will continue the petition. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie Bailey. Um, Jackie Bailey has recommended the right to Rupert Murdoch. Uh, what's members' views? Are members' well, views? I, I, I mean, I, I made it clear before, and I'll make it clear again. Why, why specifically are we talking about the sun? I mean, we may as well widen the whole, the whole aspect. Never mind, you know, whatever, uh, you know, the, the, those that are involved, I don't approve of it, but if they wish to do it, you know, we're, we're now encroaching upon certain freedoms. But in general, you know, while, while supporting this, let's not particularise on what It's like yeah. another petition that we had about say no to a, a particular supermarket. Yeah. I mean, in, in, if there's a general issue then I have this concern about, you know, yeah. we'll pillory we'll one particular area. Let's, let's yeah. look at the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to get involved in the debate. Merely to say is we can obviously <coughs> only deal with petitions in front of us, and the petition in front of us specifically mentioned Scottish Sun, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. That's why Jackie Bailey made that suggestion. So could I ask the committee's view on whether we write to Rupert Murdoch or not? Uh, Alma Taggart. Thanks, convener. Um, Yes, yes, I totally agree that we should be writing to Rupert Murdoch, but I also am absolutely disgusted that we have that we have such newspapers within the Parliament itself, and and I fully appreciate. I've read the Parliament news, the letter that has been sent from the corporate body. I'm not really sure why we're still here um, deliberating this. There's other, other areas that the Sun do distribute that they're without page three. Why not here? I'm absolutely appalled that it's still ongoing. The recommendation, if the committee agreed to this, would be to write to the Equalities and Human Rights Commission about that very point. Um, Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I think it's on record that when this petition came before the committee at the start, I, I did suggest uh, that we write to Rupert Murdoch. So um, I clearly... Uh, concur with Jackie Bailey. Jackson Carlo. So, so, so the first point is: our members agreeable that we write to Qualities and Human Rights Commission the terms identified earlier. Is that agreeable? Silence being assent. And secondly, we write to Rupert Murdoch. Uh, in term, um, I'm effectively asking views on the the petition, which is um, obviously in front of us. Can I just express, again, deep concern that we're particularising. Uh, I mean, you, you might as well run Daily Star, Daily Sport, all of these other organisations. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Mr. Brady, you made your point clear. I just re-emphasise re the point I'm making. We're dealing with a specific petition which yeah. mentions a specific paper. If other petitions come dealing with other papers, we obviously uh, deal with that. Um, <coughs> I'm conscious with time. Uh, with the members' agreement, it's possible I could defer the other petitions and go straight to private. Um, I can just get your permission first that we do defer to a future meeting the other petitions and apologise uh, to the petitioners that we're having to do that and uh, go straight into private session, which will only take a minute. Um, is there nobody in the gallery? No. Uh, thanks. You're sprinting. Thank you all.